all seen all of the controversy over future model projections that are trying to estimate the climate difference between now and 50 years time. But if 50 years isn't very long, what we're trying to do with paleoclimate um, reconstructions is to, to estimate climates not 50 years ago, but 5,000 years ago, 20,000 years ago, 5 million years ago. And there's this general principle that the further away you are from the present, either in future time or historical time, the less your model certainty is, and generally speaking, the coarser your model resolution is. So if we were to put our 50 years future climate projections would sit about here, and our reconstructions of the KT boundary are going to be way off here with massive extra amounts of uncertainty. Okay? And so take the controversy from the 50 years in the future and multiply it by a factor of something. Okay, so um, there's a lot of extra complexities with our paleoclimate reconstructions than with our future climate reconstructions. Yeah? So there are extreme climatic differences, much more than are projected for 50 years or 100 years into the future. Okay? We've got issues about sea level changes. So we've got tens or 100 meter sea level differences between different um, times in the past. And that obviously has an impact on coastlines and uh, basically where's land and where's sea. We've got major features such as the ice sheets, which dramatically <coughs> change the biological conditions in different areas. So this is the last glacial, this is a reconstruction of the last glacial map. You can see the bottom side of our sheet and uh, uh, covering large areas of what are currently habitable land for many organisms. And it's to go, you know, 20 foot of ice on top of it and there's not so much that's going to live there. When we're starting to move back into, um, uh, you know, millions of years, where then we start to think about continental drift, so basically our land structures are in different places. Uh, we have to think about ocean circulation. When you when you have linkages between uh, continents or you remove those continents, the ocean circulation patterns are entirely different than, than they are in the present day. We have uh, Mountain ranges, some mountain ranges, the Himalayas are the, the reason they're so tall is they're relatively young. And these, the appearance or the disappearance of these mountain ranges have dramatic impacts on uh, the climates that are reconstructed. So uh, one, of the, one of the things I remember from speaking with uh, paleoclimatologists is the controversy over the height of the Himalayas and the impact that this has on the monsoons uh, in um, Southeast Asia, and so the paleoclimate reconstruction is really dependent on the, the, the height of the Himalayas has a massive influence on whether there are monsoons and when they fall. And uh, finally, we've got massive vegetation differences, and large areas of vegetation can themselves create different climatic conditions. So, what we see the uh, Amazon rainfall basically creates its own weather. Um, and the presence or the absence of that um, has an influence on local weather conditions that uh, actually, uh, when you've got really deep problems, <coughs> they're now more than local, they're regional weather patterns. Okay, so we've got all of these extra complexities that make it in some way more difficult to reconstruct paleoclimates. But a, the saving grace is that unlike future um, um, climates, we actually have some direct evidence that, that tells us something about <coughs> paleoclimate conditions. And so, um, some examples here we have um, for 
reasonably short term over uh, the sort of hundreds or thousands of years. We've got direct evidence from mice cores. We've got tree rings. We've got um, corals where we can look at, uh, for example, tree rings and we can infer climatic conditions from growth rates. We can uh, look at ice cores, we can look at atmospheric conditions by looking at bubbles uh, in, the, in the ice core. Uh, and over a longer term, uh, we can look at fossils. So uh, one of the things that they use to validate um, uh, paleoclimate reconstructions is they look at the shape of leaves. Um, and essentially, leaf restrictives mean that you're in um, wet conditions. Um, uh, so this is this is you know not not as good evidence as say triggering, but it gives you a sort of broadest uh, idea of um, um, what's been growing in this location, and then you can infer some level of what climate is there. And obviously the, the geological record, so we get um, we get chalk where we used to have marine um, uh, shell organisms or corals. So um, some extra considerations for when we when we try to use paleoclimate reconstruction. Um, there are some very large biology uh, reasons <coughs> significant uncertainties. So here's uh, a reconstruction of the ice sheet over the uh, 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 North America. Um, these are two different reconstructions at 40,000 uh, years ago, and you can see that these are very different yeah, in the sense that. One has got a, a massive continuous ice sheet, and, and the other has got this channel. And uh, obviously, from here, in terms of biology, we've got extra available habitat for most of the organisms we're looking that we're interested in in one reconstruction, and not in another. Okay, and this is and this conceptually is very different between the difference between uh, a temperature of five degrees and a temperature of seven degrees. This is there's habitat available or there's not. Yeah? Um, so we need to keep in mind that there's big uncertainty over things like this and that has a massive influence over the area that we might uh, predict as suitable using our models. And another thing that um, um, I think about I think about this is in some way building in some circularity into any uh, uh, paleo projection is that underlying uh, these paleoclimate reconstructions, there's a there's a sort of vegetation model, a, 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 a biome sort of scale model that is used to help uh, reconstruct um, uh, precipitation patterns. So if we're then trying to model a uh, uh, a, a tropical forest species. Essentially, we're very likely to just hit the areas where the bio reconstruction says that there's tropical rainforest. <coughs> so uh, we need to think about what our species is and how these bio reconstructions might basically shoehorn our projections into a particular area. So, in summary, the things that we need to sort of Think about from a practical perspective um, when we're trying to use paleoclimate reconstructions. Because uh, uh, of the massive amount of computation effort that's required to start in the present and then go back thousands or millions of years, um, uh, these models tend to be at very coarse resolutions to um, make it computationally uh, practical to, to reconstruct them. Um, there's some difficulty uh, upscaling these layers. I think we've got a slide on this, but um, the, the methodology we were talking about yesterday of um, having coarse resolution grids and then using present day high resolution grids to try to upscale. Yeah? So we're using, we're using modern day variation to superimpose onto our um, uh, different time reconstructions. That seems reasonable when we're looking at 50-year time frames where we have 
no realistic expectation of you know, big geographic changes. But for example, the Weltlin layers that you can download for the last spatial maximum use the same techniques to upscale for the last spatial maximum. But now we think that um, here we're using current land variations and we're using that to sit on top of areas that, are now, that, are, that were seen at the last spatial maximum and vice versa. And it, to, to me that seems rather shaky. Yeah? So the same sorts of upscaling that we use for future climate, I don't think it's safe to use in, for, for paleoclimate. Some people, some people use it. Uh, personally, I don't like it. Um, generally speaking, all of the, all of, uh, a lot of the research effort is obviously interested in things that will directly worry us, which are future climate change. So there's more, much more research effort looking at future climates than there is past climates, which actually has an impact on availability of data. There's lots of, there's lots of um, future climate scenarios that we can very easily access. The paleoclimate data is a, a lot harder to get hold of. Um, and these tend to be focused on the interesting um, um, time periods like the last glacial maximum or um, major um, boundaries like KT. <coughs> um, but this, this is improving all the time, so more data is becoming available. The last thing I um, point out is that there's some temporal uncertainty on the, the dates of these reconstructions. So we have a last glacial maximum reconstruction, but the, uncertainty, the temporal uncertainty of these tends to be plus or minus a couple of thousand years. When we move back to uh, larger time periods, say eight or ten million years ago, then the temporal uncertainty is plus or minus <coughs> two million years. Okay, and that's a very large time period. Okay? Um, we need to keep that in mind when we're saying this was our reconstruction at, you know, whatever, million, thousand years ago. There's some uncertainty as to when exactly this reconstruction is for. Okay, and the question I get a lot is where can I get paleoclimate data because it's not as widely available. 